Oh yeah. Is that cool? I hope so. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I just have bad dark. Yeah, <laughs> it's tough for you. <laughs> Good to be that age. Oh, should be a, Oh, what's up? So we have Chris, who will be presenting us with uh, security with Kubernetes. Thank you, Chris. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Chris Fiantine, Chief Technologist for the West Coast at Red Hat. And I'm going to talk about uh, continuous security with Kubernetes. Uh, first off, you know, Andy Grove back in the 90s talked about how only the paranoid survive, and it's not about security, but it was about strategic inflection points when there's massive amounts of change in an industry, and a company has to decide, do they pivot and change course or stay as is? And many, many companies are having to make that decision across all different industries right now, but also in terms of security, we're seeing a lot of disruption, and there's a need to make some changes in terms of how we approach security security in the enterprise. Uh, first off, certainly a lot of adoption of DevOps, right? The movement to speeding up innovation and having a short feedback loop. This is contrasts really with uh, security sometimes in that security is often viewed as a bottleneck. So how do we continue accelerating delivery of applications yet continue to be secure? So we'll talk about that. Also, the evolution to how applications are developed with cloud native applications. These are typically distributed across either one or multiple environments. The network is increasingly becoming important. So how do we address security uh, with a highly distributed, lots of microservices in your architecture? And then thirdly, a movement towards hybrid cloud environments. This is where you may have your development environment in public cloud and your production environment in your private cloud. And so how do we manage security? No longer have control of the perimeter in the physical data center. Right? It's spanning across multiple environments, and so this has many security implications as well. And so there's a big movement towards DevSecOps, right? Heard about DevOps, but DevSecOps is about integrating security into DevOps, not slowing down the business and not making the business more at risk, but rather integrating security in terms of the culture, the process, as well as the tooling end to end. And the value of DevOps is all, DevSecOps is all about reducing your risks, lowering the costs, also speeding up your delivery and the reaction time. And this is done through automation, process optimization, as well as continuous security improvement. And containers are a big part of this uh, because they provide a standard runtime and a standard image format that allows you to package your application up once in a container and then deploy it across any environment, physical, virtual, private, or public cloud. And this allows you to have consistency and reduce the risk of having a vulnerability or change introduced along the pipeline. And so DevSecOps, in terms of technology, we're seeing really Kubernetes providing a lot of the value around automating not only the delivery of your applications and microservices to a clustered environment at scale, but also becoming the security platform that can span across physical, virtual, private, and public cloud. Kubernetes itself provides automation, and some of the key characteristics and value of it is, one is it provides the orchestration of your microservices at scale. It also provides automated health checks to ensure that that microservice is continually running so you don't get the page at 2 a.m. It'll actually detect it and replace a broken container or pod. And then thirdly, it will actually auto-scale your services to meet the demands that are being placed on the service from a load perspective. But what about security? 
Kubernetes can be viewed as a security platform because it can standardize your security practices across all the providers, bare metal, virtual, private, public cloud. So rather than having security per provider, right, you can abstract your security processes and provide that consistently across all of these environments. Now, one of the key concerns with security is, or with containers, is twofold. One is we're seeing issues around container images, right? Folks are pulling them down from the public repositories. And for example, on the far left, there was a case where there was some crypto mining inserted into images that were on the public repo for over a year on address. And so folks are pulling down images that are tainted and have security issues. All also, folks are having issues in regards to the configuration and the setup of their Kubernetes environments at scale. Uh, Tesla and Weight Watchers both had vulnerabilities into their Kubernetes dashboards, exposing proprietary data potentially uh, to the public as well. So it's very important to make sure that you're addressing security in your container environment. And so today we're going to talk about some best practices when it comes to securing your environment from builds, images, registry, container hosts, and CI, CD to start with. So first off, container builds. Uh, the basic uh, flow for building out your containers is to build, ship, and run. Right? You define the spec in your build file. This is kind of your blueprint for how to build the container image. And then you share it by pushing it into a registry, and then you can pull it down across your private, public, physical, or virtual environment and have that run on a standard runtime. One of the key value props of moving to containers is getting everyone to speak the same language when it comes to producing your application. Today, you particularly have maybe your operations folks using a kickstart file, your middleware team providing a tarball with their middleware layer, and then the application developer providing the jar file. Well, with a container environment, you can all adopt standard tooling, such as a Docker file. Right now, everyone can define their particular delivery in the Docker file, and then you can build a resulting container image from the multiple layers, with each layer being defined by that build file. This allows you to collaborate and share, and also use the same tooling in the same language, so better communication and faster delivery. In terms of the container builds, some best practices around security. First off, treat that build file as a blueprint. Uh, one of the things to note is when you're pulling down those container images, most of them require root to run, and certainly we don't want to run root uh, processes on our host systems uh, because they'll expose not only your container and the host, but other containers to uh, potential breaches. So specify a user in your build file. Secondly, uh, also don't log in to build and configure your container instance. Right? Don't SSH in and then save that to a, a file because you don't have a record or recipe of how and what change was made. Also, version control the build file. So put that into a source repository so you can go back in time and have a record of that. And be explicit with the versions in your build files. Uh, don't use the latest, actually put like version 1.1 for example, the tag for that image. And then keep in mind that each run creates a new layer, so you want to reduce your use of that from a performance perspective. Also, uh, container image security. Let's talk about some best practices there. First off, on the left, typically uh, the application developer today is just delivering a, a jar file. In the new world, in the container world, they're delivering much more than that. They're delivering the application, they're delivering the language runtime, and the OS dependencies. Right? So what does that mean from an ownership perspective? Right? We talked about having the different layers and everybody owning their own layer previously. And so when it comes to security, those folks will be responsible for tracking the security issues for their particular layer. 
Also, best practice is to treat containers as immutable. What does this mean? This means the container image should just contain the application and its immediate dependencies at the app and OS layer and extract your configuration and your data out of that image. In Kubernetes, they provide objects such as config maps and, and secrets to actually store your configuration. Right. Config maps can be used to set environment variables or a flat file that's mounted at runtime into the uh, container. Uh, so maybe you want to have a string or an IP address set in an environment variable. You can do that with Kubernetes config map so it's not statically stored into a container image, reducing you know, security risk as well. Also, uh, your data. You want to leverage a data service or a persistent volume to store your persistent data. That could be a traditional SQL service or a persistent volume can be used to store some configuration and that will persist from one container uh, in runtime to an X. And then lastly, when it comes to container images, a best practice is to make sure that you're signing your images so that you know they're coming from and you can validate whether it's a trusted source or not. In Kubernetes, you can actually check to make sure that image is signed before the kubelet will actually launch that image and create an instance on a host system. Uh, also, container registry security, some best practices here. At Red Hat, we did a scan of the public Docker repo and found that about 64% have a higher medium security vulnerability. Right? So when developers are pulling this down in the enterprise, they're actually pulling in images already tainted. And so one of the best practices, and actually usually the first step we see with enterprises is that they set up a private registry, a trusted source for your content within your enterprise that you can have an audit trail. Also, the private registry allows you to go back in time and have all the dependencies if you're storing them in your local private registry. If you're accessing dependencies in a public registry, you don't know in 6, 12 months down the road will that dependency still exist with that explicit version. And so by having a private registry, it also allows you to store that information. Container host security. Uh, containers are Linux, and the reason containers are Linux is because by default, really, containers are not very secure, and Linux provides many uh, security features to ensure uh, improved security around your container processes, including C groups. Um, namespaces, SE Linux, SecComp, and read-only mounts, and we'll go through those. So first off, C groups. This provides resource isolation. So how do you provide quality of service in a multi-tenant environment? And that's what C groups delivers. It's ensuring that your CPU, memory, network, storage are guaranteed levels to each process or container uh, that's running on a host system so you don't have the issue of one process consuming everything and not leaving enough for other processes processes or containers on that system. Uh, namespaces is another security feature, and that allows the container, in terms of PID namespaces, to only see the processes within the container and not in any processes of the host or other containers. Right? So it provides that isolation. It also provides on the network namespaces isolation as well, so I can confidently deploy, for instance, 13 applications with 13 different security networks and all have them isolated and live happily on one system in a secure manner. SE Linux uh, provides mandatory access controls to a process. So this allows you to have a process and basically essentially ha forces you to explicitly define what that process has access to on that system. So even if it's running as root, it doesn't get access to anything it's not explicitly stated. Right? So that provides a higher level of security for your container. And in SecComp, this provides security your computing mode, restricting processes capabilities and attaching a system call filter. Right? There's many different system calls that a process can access 
if you can li limit this and f provide a filter, this allows you to improve your security of your container environment and reduce the attack surface by taking away those capabilities from the process. And then finally, uh, read-only mounts. Right? The ability to mount file systems in a read-only manner so that a rogue uh, system or vulnerability does not have the ability, for example, to change kernel uh, parameter, system parameters uh, on the system in the slash proc or slash sys as well. So some best practices around the host, you know, don't run as root, limit SSH, use the namespaces, be sure to define resource quotas. So Kubernetes allows you to define uh, quotas, ensuring that you don't over consume and provide some sort of security issue because the disk is out of space. Also enable logging, apply security route not just to your container instances, but also, or container images, but also apply it to the hosts, right? You need to continue that best practice there. Uh, also applying setcom filters and make sure that you're running unprivileged containers as read only as well in production. And we'll talk about that. In terms of your container runtime engine, uh, there are many choices out there. Uh, CIRO is a r relatively newer uh, solution on the marketplace. Uh, the container runtime interface, CRI, uh, is the Kubernetes API for container runtimes to integrate uh, with the kubelet, which runs on your nodes. Uh, the CIRO is a open source container runtime that is OCI compliant, right? So OCI provides a standard image format and a standard runtime, but it's built up from the ground up to uh, lockstep with Kubernetes, CRI, and security first uh, priority. It's a community built out of IBM, SUSE, Intel, uh, Hyper, as well as uh, Red Hat. Right, so this is an alternative runtime uh, that's more security minded. Uh, and one of the key things that it addresses is it provides a read-only uh, mode. So in, traditionally, when you, if you use the Docker uh, runtime, you can basically have read-write access to the root file system. So if I'm a security uh, vulnerability, I could actually install onto the root file system and potentially make some modifications uh, to that. If I use CIO in read-only mode, it actually allows you to mount the root file system in read-only. So even if I tried to attack the root file system, I wouldn't be able to write, and I would be prevented from actually installing on the root file system of my container. So another security protection that you want to keep in mind that is available out there. A continuous integration with containers, right? We talked about some security best practice and the images, the runtime, but what about inserting it into your CI CD pipeline? One of the things we found is that, you know, with security issues in containers, it's not just a matter of is there an issue now, but also on an ongoing basis. So I need to continually be concerned about is there a security issue in my container? In this example, from left to right, we have a C, Java, Node.js, Perl PHP application, and it shows the dependencies that are being pulled in as I build that container image. Uh, in the second column, that's a Java app. It pulled in the JRE. What you may not be able to see is that in the triangle is a 66. Well, there's been 66 and in, in counting security notifications for the JRE since RHEL 7.0 was released. So so I need to have a process on an ongoing basis for my layer that I own to scan that layer and to make sure there aren't security issues there. And so I want to be able to integrate that into my overall CI CD process. So this is an example of a CI CD dev test in production. I go ahead and check in my build files, my source code, I'm version control them. And I want to have a reproducible build process. And the way I can do that is by leveraging a, a build image. Right? A build image allows me to have a version control build environment that I can go back in time and leverage as well as use to ensure that I have a known state for when I'm building my images. 
I can then produce a resulting target image containing my application and just the necessary dependencies. And then putting that into the image registry as well. And then be able to build that once and then push to test and push into production. Also, as a part of this CI-CD process, this is an example of a Jenkins pipeline. I want to be able to insert a security scan into my overall pipeline. And so typically you'll add a phase security there uh, as a part of my CI process. So every time I build an image, it gets scanned for security vulnerabilities. And I can do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, one is I can leverage a scanning tool such as OpenSCAP, which is an upstream open source solution and that provides the ability to scan for vulnerabilities as well as to check for security compliance. Right? I can define a security standard such as uh, minimum password length for a user and make sure that that's also checked. And I can get reports uh, from an auditing perspective as well. And so I may want to insert that into my Jenkins pipeline. I could also leverage some of the automated scanning solutions in the registry that I'm using, in the private registry. So some of them, when you push to the registry, it would also trigger a security scan as well. So Quay, for example, has a, the Clair scanner built into it. Uh, how about continuous delivery with containers? So one of the key differences in moving to a container environment is that typically today in production environment, if there's a security issue, the operations team will go out and patch the running virtual machine or physical systems to eliminate that security vulnerability. Well, in a container environment, I now have a software factory which allows me to push from development into production in a matter of minutes. So rather than patching production, I'm going to go back to development and build version N plus one with that security fix. Right? And then, so I build it once, I put it through QA, I put it through that security scan, and then push it into production. Right? I don't patch the container instance in production. Go back to development. And so how would I go about deploying at scale? I no longer have one physical machine or 10 VMs. I may have 100 or more container instances. I need help in automating that at scale. And so continuous delivery deployment strategies, Kubernetes has automated uh, strategies built in, such as recreate, rolling updates, a blue-green deployment, as well as Canary uh, with AB testing. And we'll talk about these. First off, recreate. This is the simplest way to deploy at scale with Kubernetes. Uh, you'll have your existing version out in production. There's a security issue. I need to get version 1.2 out. I'm going to put that in my uh, testing cycle. It's going to go through the automated scan. And in the recreate, I just bring down the existing cluster. Simple as that. And I go ahead and deploy a new cluster with a new version. Uh, why would I do this? It's simple. I don't have to interact with the developers. They don't have to be aware of this. They don't need to uh, make sure their APIs or the data is in sync. But the negative is there's downtime. And so what about when I need zero downtime? And that's when I may want to use a rolling update or blue-green. So let's talk about those. So a rolling update with zero downtime, I have my existing cluster out there. I'm testing that new security patch in 1.2. I'm going to go ahead and incrementally roll that out across my cluster one by one, and I can leverage the Kubernetes health check to make sure it doesn't come online before it's ready. And for example, I might want to do a health check to make sure that the front end is receiving a response back from the back end before I add it into the load balancer. So Kubernetes will add it into the load balancer once that health check is completed and gradually roll it out across my cluster. I can control this or have it in an automated manner until it's at 100%. Right, so the advantage of the rolling update method is that I can have zero downtime. Right? I don't have to bring down the cluster and have a period of no uh, response to my users. 
uh, reduce that risk, and I can also roll it back at any point in time if I see that that security patch has a negative impact on my business or user experience. Uh, one of the things I need to work with my developers, though, is to ensure they're aware that there are going to be two versions side by side, potentially for some period of time in my environment. So there needs to be some backward compatibility, maybe in terms of APIs or the data as well. Also, I have the option of doing blue-green deployments. A uh, blue-green is where you have version one out there in the blue environment. All the traffic is going to it. I then deploy the new security update in 1.2 to my green environment. <clears throat> so this is a virtually separate environment on the same physical infrastructure. So with Kubernetes, I can create n number of, of mirrors of my production environment, for example. Um, and then I can do my testing offline once it successfully completes for that new version. I can then adjust the software load balancer to direct all the traffic over to that green environment. Right? Big difference here is I didn't touch the blue environment at all. So it remains as is. Why would I want to do that? Well, if I want to do a rollback, I can confidently roll back to what the environment looked like before the green. Right? And so this allows for zero downtime as well. Um, but it does take more physical resources because I have two logical environments uh, side by side. Right? I also need to be in sync with my development team uh, because there may need to do some data synchronization uh, from the blue to green environment or vice versa if I do a rollback as well. Uh, the last one I'm going to talk about is canary deployments with A-B testing. You know, with you, the movement towards microservices, uh, one of the key things around DevSecOps is to experiment and try things out. And if it doesn't work, you can revert and, and change course. Uh, no different with microservices. You know, only about a third of ideas improve the metrics they were designed to improve. Right? So need to foster this culture of experimentation and have the systems that enable you to pivot. And one of the other key things is that you, of DevSecOps is that you have this continuous feedback loop. Right? You shorten that feedback loop so you get real-time feedback on how the system is going, how the application is behaving, or how the business is functioning under that new version with that security patch. And so I want to enable my developers to experiment, and Kubernetes does exactly that. For example, on the left side, I have version A of my application and version B on the right with a slightly different recommendation engine and potentially a security patch in that version B. And so I want to do a canary deployment. And what this means is I have version 1 currently accepting all the traffic. Version 1.2 has that security patch. I want to monitor and see what the impact is as I roll out a subset to a subset of environment this new version. So right now I have 100% and on the do 50-50. Right? And so I want to be able to monitor and I'm seeing by deploying that new version, I actually improve the conversion rate, the click-through rate. So the recommendation engine or the security patch did not have a negative impact, it actually had a positive impact uh, on my business. And so I'm going to go ahead and fully deploy over to that new version. If I had detected a decline in my business, a lower conversion rate, I could have reverted back and rolled back and eliminated that canary by directing everything to the existing version. So canary deployments uh, with A-B testing. Also, uh, securing your container environment, there are many other, other aspects in a Kubernetes environment around network isolation, monitoring, storage, APIs, and federated clusters. <clears throat> so let's talk about those. Network security. Uh, one of the things with network security on the left, you have your traditional model. You have <laughs> typically a three-tier DMZ, the internal, and your database. So each layer is a zone in your network. Uh, and typically only the DMZ is exposed to the, uh, the public internet. On the right side, uh, you know, Kubernetes is using a, a flat SDN model. Uh, all the pods get an IP from the uh, same network, and you live on the same logical network as well. And it assumes 
all nodes can communicate with each other at the host level. Uh, one of the things Kubernetes provides is network isolation with network namespaces. So that enables you to have multi-environments. You could have dev test and production all on the same physical infrastructure, but logically separated through network namespaces. You can also have multiple business units or projects sharing the same host, but having networks separation through network namespaces as well. Uh, Kubernetes also allows you to have fine granular control over the service-to-service -service communication via network policy. So I can explicitly define a policy to control the communication from one microservice to another. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing in terms of the uh, network security models of our customers, really three different models is one is folks are setting up one Kubernetes cluster per zone. So in your traditional DMZ app database model, uh, you would have a cluster per each zone and then you have the egress and routers uh, for inbound and outbound traffic. Also, uh, you could have one Kubernetes cluster spread across multiple zones, right? So this is where you have the Kubernetes cluster and then uh, directing the traffic for, for example, A and B would be routed through the network zone A and then your C and D applications would be routed through network zone B. Uh, through the egress and uh, routers. And then thirdly, your physical compute isolation based on network zones. That's another model. This is where the individual hosts are tied to a particular network zone. So in this example, A and B applications would be routed based on tags uh, to the green nodes. And then C and D applications would be routed to the blue nodes. And those nodes would be targeted uh, to the, would be directed to the appropriate network zone on the left. Monitoring and logging. So as you move to a Kubernetes environment, uh, there's many different considerations you have. In today's world, you're worried about the application and the host in terms of monitoring considerations. Well, in a Kubernetes environment, you want to be monitoring Kubernetes itself, but also the containers, and you want some feedback in terms of how that's behaving. And so there's a variety of metrics that you may be interested. Even the application has evolved as well into more distributed, so you want some distributed monitoring tools, uh, such as a, uh, a tracing tool, Jaeger is an example, uh, Prometheus and Grafana providing application, and then also uh, Kubernetes level monitoring uh, for you as well in real time. Uh, so here's some recommended uh, tools and monitoring that you may want to consider uh, for your Kubernetes and container environment. Uh, here's just a detailed level of what uh, Prometheus and Grafana looks like. You have some customizable dashboards and the underlying infrastructure to monitor in real time your infrastructure and then provide some alert management as well. Uh, in terms of logging, Kubernetes also provides the ability to aggregate and centrally store your logs. You can plug it into Splunk, for example, or uh, EFK, Elasticsearch, uh, to help you in your debugging for security issues and as well as alert you to any anomalies. What about storage security? So Kubernetes is not just for uh, stateless applications. Uh, Kubernetes provides the ability to have persistent storage. And so you can set up things like different tiers of storage and then limit your services to only have access to specific tiers, so a form of security, as well as uh, providing resource quota limits to ensure that folks don't uh, fill up your disk as well. And then API and platform access. Uh, Kubernetes has an API, and as we saw uh, in some earlier examples, uh, if you don't have security hardened on your Kubernetes cluster, you expose yourself to being uh, penetrated by uh, some security hackers. And so you want to make sure that you're uh, locking down your environment. It's good practice to put in, for example, an API uh, proxy gateway uh, to limit 
access to your APIs as well as provide quality of service and an audit trail of those who are accessing it. And define users and groups to limit their access. And then lastly, uh, federation. So federation is a new and upcoming movement around the Kubernetes community. It provides the ability to set up a multiple clusters, have a single API across those clusters. From a security perspective, we want to do this because maybe you have one cluster that's PCI compliant, uh, and then you would direct workloads uh, to that particular cluster. And then for your dev test, you may reduce the amount of security around that environment uh, so that they could experiment and try things out a little bit more. Uh, so what's next? Uh, there's a lot of movement towards uh, providing management at the service mesh layer with uh, microservices. So Istio, for example, is a service mesh uh, management solution. It provides monitoring and metrics, access control. Uh, you can also inject faults do traffic routing and encryption and authentication. So from a security perspective, I'd say a few of the things it provides is that it allows you to manage uh, your uh, keys for service to service communication and rotate those out. Uh, it also allows you, by default, it has an egress around the uh, proxy that gets attached to the service. Uh, so by default, nothing is going outside unless you whitelist. Uh, so that's another nice thing from a security perspective. Uh, also, uh, in terms of routing, it allows you to route based on headers. Uh, also, it allows you to more finely control the traffic instead of at a per pod basis. You can actually get into a per percentage basis. Uh, so just a lot more uh, finer grainer control around your uh, traffic with the, uh, the service mesh. So Istio, and I'm sure you'll hear a lot more about that, it just released 1.0. Uh, it's a project uh, out there now in the upstream community. Uh, DevSecOps metrics, to close it out here, here are some metrics you may want to track to ensure that you're successfully tracking to a successful DevSecOps uh, implementation. One is a compliance score, so monitor you know, the, the scans that you're going through with your containers and seeing if they're compliant to not only vulnerability check, but also security uh, compliance. Uh, deployment frequency, so how often are you deploying? Is that improving? Uh, what is the lead time to get that from dev into production? Uh, what's the failure rate when you do go to production, as well as the MTR? Re how quickly can you recover when there is an issue in production and get it through your pipeline? And of course, service availability as well. So with that, I want to thank you for attending today's session. Uh, my name is Chris Fantine. Uh, here's my email address. Feel free to reach out. I'm also available on LinkedIn. Uh, you're happy to uh, connect with you there as well. So thank you so much. Oh, yeah, do we have time? Oh, yes, uh, any questions today? Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Chris.